So we don't have any grand plan for this afternoon, as you probably saw this morning. We're capable of rambling for hours at a time. But uh, we would like to answer any questions that people might have. And I'll tell you a little bit about the room that we're living in. This, this was not here originally. Swamiji so has the idea from before I knew him that the proper housing was round. And I remember that he used to point out uh, one time we went to the uh, planetarium. They have a planetarium in uh, Golden Gate Park. And one time we went there and he, he wanted to point out that that round shape conformed somehow um, both spiritually and probably aesthetically. He said the head is round and the energy goes out from that and in a round space it feels harmonious and natural. In a, a square space and especially a low space, you know how you feel when you go into a confined space. It's as if something is oppressive pushing down on you. But in a dome, you don't have that feeling. It feels very open and just natural. Whether you cognize it or not, that feeling is there. He also pointed out a story of one time he was there and a whole group of young kids came in. Some teacher had brought their class to see the planetarium. And they were all restless and noisy. And then as they came in and started sitting down, this was before any of the show or stars or galaxies had come on. They were just kind of looking around and he noticed that they all quieted down. And he has said that the natural form of construction in this age is a hemisphere. In Treta Yuga, it's a pyramid, which also has an energy vortex to it. And in the highest age, uh, Satya Yuga, it's a sphere. And I don't know if any of you have ever been in the Pantheon in Rome, but it is, uh, it's a hemisphere. This was built um, probably 200 AD. 200 AD I think, in there. Amazing structure. It was done with uh, cast concrete. But it's a hemisphere but it's up on a wall, and uh, a round wall, and it is placed at exactly the height so that if, if the dome continued, that hemisphere would come down and just touch the floor at the center. And standing in that structure, one feels very, very uplifted. There, there really is, there, there's in fact a type of yoga, yantra, yoga that has to do with shapes. Um, at any rate, coming back to the story of Ananda, Swamiji had always felt that the dome was the proper structures, kind of structures that we should at least try to build. And, um, but he didn't know how to do it, and of course constructing round structures is difficult and expensive. But then he read an article in Popular Science popular mechanics about the, uh, a famous inventor, Buckminster Fuller, had invented the geodesic dome, of which this is, and there are many, many around the world. It's a very strong structure once it's in place. There's no wall. The, the wall and the roof are one and the same. It's dome-shaped. And once all the struts are in place, because triangles are inherently strong, it's a very stable structure. So at any rate, Swami read in Popular Mechanics about how to build a sun dome in your backyard. And it had the construction method like that. Well, there's a little difference between building something in your backyard and building <laughs> something that's supposed to endure. Um, Swami was never a builder. And so, at any rate, this comes from the plans, probably expanded somewhat, 
uh, of the popular mechanics uh, plans on how to build your own very own geodesic dome. And so the first one collapsed. The second one was up for a little while, and it was beautiful. We were in it, you know, it was clear plastic. It was beautiful and it started raining. And if you ignored the leaks, which is another problem with domes, if you ignored the leaks, looking up through the plastic, it was all kind of uh, rainbow effects, and it was beautiful. But uh, I think the wind picked that one up and <laughs> just moved it across the countryside <laughs> weekend after we left. And I'm not quite sure what happened to the third one, but there was a third one also that didn't make it. But many of the first structures at Ananda were domes, and they were done that way because of the spiritual effect of that rounded shape that Swamiji would really have liked to have seen at Ananda. And this was uh, essentially the best approximation to that that we could have. So as, as you saw in those early pictures uh, that were projected this morning of, of the retreat, the first several buildings up there were, uh, were geodesic domes. Any other stories? With you know, I thought this may or may not be fun, but um, since I think Sanda mentioned that we were all teepee dwellers, maybe if each one of us could tell a brief story of something that happened to us while we were living in our teepee, that <laughs> might be general interest, and then we can see that might kind of get people to relax and then you'll ask questions. So I can, I'll just start. I, uh, I love the description of Benai, how he painted his teepee. Well, um, I went to the, uh, I thought, well, I need to paint my, my teepee too, and I'm going to do it in, you know, kind of earth tones and Native American colors. And so I went to the um, hardware store, and I explained to them, and there were, so the man gave me a little tube of paint. He said, this will be a very nice kind of an ochre color. And, uh, and you just have to mix it with some white paint. But somehow there was some mix up, and when I mixed it with the white paint, it was like bright pink. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was the only color I had, so I had a pink. <laughs> but, um, but then on the very top, you know, the poles stuck out, and I tied little strips of cloth with little bells on the end, so when the wind blew, it was you could hear the little bells. And then there were no doors; there were just canvas flaps. And so one morning, uh, I woke up and I was reading this very inspiring book called St. Francis by Cousin Zakas. And so I opened, I, I finished meditating and I opened up and um, well, at first I looked at it, it had been raining, and I opened the flap up and there was a lot of mist on the mountains and the thought just came in my mind, oh, the mountains are blanketed with mist. And then I opened the book, uh, the first sentence of the chapter said the mountains were blanketed with mist. I thought, oh. <laughs> I heard the wind blowing through the trees, and it said St. Francis heard the wind blowing through the trees. <laughs> That's kind of weird. And then it made the little bells on the top of my teepee start to tingle. And, and it said he could, in the distance, he heard the sound of bell. <laughs> I was getting really freaked out by this. <laughs> and it, the next sentence was, he knew it was the coming of the lepers. <laughs> I don't remember. I had many things that came in my teeth. Yeah, I had uh, raccoons that would fight inside of it, and they would take my food and open up the. But the, I have one story I want to tell, and that's uh, when I had moved the teepee over to the monastery, and it was up on top of the hill here at Ayodhya, and uh, uh, Swami Satchidananda had came come by to visit, and uh, when he came there was a entourage with him. And uh, along with, um, uh, I think they were filming or something, 
and they wanted to come inside my teepee. And <laughs> so they did come inside, and they were filming, and they were using very uh, bright lights, and the teepee had the uh, plastic on the uh, inside, and it caught it on fire. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't do any real bad damage, but <laughs> it was a <laughs> different experience. <laughs> I think fires were, were a common hazard in, in the teepees. When, when we built them uh, that fall, uh, we used all of our energy and time just to build them and get them up in time, and we hadn't thought about heating. So we really didn't have any firewood. And the firewood that had been cut was from manzanita. Well, we didn't know it, but manzanita burns really, really hot, and it doesn't catch very easily. So in the morning, uh, Davy and I were uh, neighbors on Teepee Hill, and uh, we would see each other, and I had this little hand saw, and I would go out and just uh, to, to trees and whatever and just cut off twigs just to get the fire started. But once the manzanita uh, started, it got really, really hot. And one day also, I left the fire for, for a while. I just turned around and I turned back and the whole teepee was, yeah. But I, I put it out. I put it out in time. But uh, it was, uh, it, there was a very uh, steep learning curve. We call those learning experiences. <laughs> one of the, as Sadna was saying this morning, one of the disadvantages of teepees were that they were open at the top and it was raining, and it rains a lot here during the winter time. Snow actually is not so bad because most of it falls and slides off and not so much comes in, but, but rain you can get really wet. The teepees were coated with a kind of a solution called Swenson's something. Anyway. Water. But yeah, water. Thompson water, water Seal. Yeah. <laughs> so they were all coated with that. And that did pretty well unless there was a strong wind and then that would just blow it through the teepee. But at any rate, being inside during the rainy season was not all that comfortable. And I'm a natural problem solver. So I, whenever something comes up, I only am thinking about a solution. So I came up with the idea of doing a plastic liner for the teepee. And of course, as we've all been saying, we didn't have any money for anything in those days. So it wasn't like you could design a fancy liner. But I came up with the thought that if you hung a, a rope from the middle of the top, and on that rope you tied a rock, then you could put the plastic and tie it around that and then drape it around the rest of the teepee and it formed an inner liner which had two advantages. It didn't stop the rain but it diverted it out to the side so you could find a space in the middle where you could sleep. And the other was that it did some insulation value and contained the heat. And so as we progressed along this magnificent engineering <laughs> path, we actually had wood stoves inside the teepee with a little uh, kind of a stove pipe that went up through the plastic and then out through the top. And we were able to make it somewhat more comfortably, albeit considerably more dangerous through the winter. <laughs> The coating that we put on our on the exterior, well, actually, the, the, what it was made from was just plain canvas. Just the, the, we went to the um, people who make the canvas for sale, or people who make sails for sailboats. We actually bought canvas for sails, and it wasn't that heavy. And so I sewed all this stuff together and everything. Can I interrupt you? Yeah. When Sana said I sewed 12 teepees, I mean, it isn't like sewing a shirt. <laughs> it's like we got these commercial commercial sewing machines. Uh -huh. No, I sewed it on a home sewing machine. Oh, my God. <laughs> and, I would need to make sure. I mean, and it was sewing. like, you know, like <laughs> strips of canvas like this going through a regular sewing. You know, it was not just a little thing. It was, it was 12 teepees. <laughs> Anyway, when, we, when it was all finished and everything, we realized that it, they were, it's supposed to be waterproofed in some way. And we talked about this Thompson's water seal. Well, I don't remember which one it was, but one of the things that we applied 
on it to make it waterproof. Instead, it actually destroyed the camp. <laughs> <laughs> and so almost everybody swept. It was the Thompson. It was the Thompson. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so <laughs> almost everybody, well, everyone who used that stuff lost their teepee that way. And I remember I went to San Francisco actually to buy more canvas to make more, more TVs. And when I returned from San Francisco, my TV was up there on a hillside shredding, you know, one big piece at a time. It was blowing away, I mean, you know, ripping off and blowing off onto the hillside. And that was what happened. We learned, though, from someone who was an artist that oh, what you do to prepare a canvas for painting, if you don't happen to have any gesso, which is the normal thing, you just go down to the hardware store and you buy some plain old ordinary white latex paint. And that's what we use, and when I use that for his decorated, um, and it worked just fine. <laughs> there was one fellow, uh, or as Jyoti said, we, the technology of TP dwelling evolved, and, uh, because we did quite a, we did a lot of these. We, we, every year we added some, and then people liked the idea, and we, so the, all the little accoutrements that I went with, it became quite sophisticated. Uh, but one fellow, not having, thinking to take a shortcut, he made a complete plastic teepee. <laughs> you know, it had, the, had the poles and completely lined up, uh, put the outside, was completely plastic. Now, of course, it was transparent, so it wasn't very good for privacy. <laughs> but, uh, and it was probably when the sun came out, it was terribly hot. It was just like a, like a, a greenhouse in there. Usually, the, Animals were a constant uh, for many of the teepees. Usually it was the raccoons and who would take up residence underneath because we ended up, in time, we ended up get, to get off the earth, we'd make little uh, wooden platforms inside to get off the ground. And so, the, of course, the raccoons would like to go underneath. And of course, mites, the mice uh, were always omnipresent. Uh, so, the, you know, those uh, were just, you know, the things you just dealt with and you. Uh, and, uh, lived with there was always there was always a little bit of uh, stories or, or strategies of how to get rid of the raccoons or to ward them off. And a little bit later, it, it, uh, not right then, but I devised the way for the raccoons. And I know this sounds a little cruel, but uh, the raccoons can drive you to distraction. <laughs> they're, 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 they keep coming back and coming back. But I finally devised this way. So I got a loaf of bread. And I hollowed it out, and I stuffed it full of cayenne pepper. <laughs> <laughs> and I put the plug back in, above the, and, and then I, I put it out. And sure enough, the raccoons been coming every night, and every night this raccoon would come. He was just getting to me, and then so he came, and I was watching. And he comes and he grabs that, you know, they got their paws are like this, and all of a sudden he stops. <laughs> he stops. <laughs> Away he went. <laughs> but then, you know, it's on fires, and one night I fell asleep, and I had a nice fire going. And I fell asleep, I had my sleeping bag next to the stove. And I had a floor, I had a floor by then. And uh, I fell asleep. And uh, I woke up the next morning. I, was, I woke up the next morning, and there was a hole in my floor. <laughs> I burned. Apparently, my door was not quite solid, and the fire went. It, it, a log had fallen against the door. The door had opened. The log had come up and laid on the on the, in front of the stove and burned a hole in my floor. <laughs> I never even woke up. <laughs> I don't remember I threw it. Through it. But uh, like I, I mentioned this morning, everybody went, we all went up and cut those uh, trees and stripped them and, and uh, came back. We did probably, you know, some were 150, 200 poles and stick, you know, and came back and we put them up. And uh, I didn't have, I, at that time, I was, I was uh, low on funds, you might say. And then, so I, and I didn't have any, any, I had no TV. And so, but, Everybody left, and so I ended up. I says, "Well, when they, one, a couple of the teepees were put up at the uh, retreat, at the at the <coughs> retreat, and uh, one of them happened to be hers, actually. <laughs> and uh, so I moved into that one, and uh, it was uh, uh, it started to rain that winter, 
that winter it rained 14 days straight, no break, no break, 14 days straight. Stopped for one day and then rained for six days more. And as I was in there, my space, <laughs> smaller, 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 everything, everything, books, everything just turns totally, even if it's not landing on it, the water, it just totally gets waterlogged. And so pretty soon it just, there was no space in there and, and ultimately uh, drove us out. But you know, maybe maybe we can remember some of those, some of the early people that were there, or some of the... Well, um, nobody will know them. People. No, they'll know them, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> it might be fun for us, but <laughs> there's an audience. No. Anyway, maybe a question from you guys. What would you like? For Benai. Um, what, how did the issue with the draft board solve itself? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, the FBI did end up coming up to uh, the meditation retreat, mm. and I heard them. And, uh, it, you know, it could have been two people. They had suits on, so it was either SRF <laughs> or... <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, so, so I, I kept away from them. And, uh, uh, and then called my mother up and went down to see my mother. And they had been harassing her. And it just, you know, threatening her with her job. Uh, they can, uh, I, um, the FBI that I talked to originally was very nice, but they're field operatives, you know, they're doing another kind of thing. They're trying to find people. Um, so I realized I had to, you know, uh, turn myself in. I, I wanted to make them put out as much energy as they had to. You know, I wasn't just going to give myself to them. But at that time, I went to um, San Francisco. I contacted my friend Tom Hopkins. He had already had a lawyer that helped him through a, a problem, the same similar problem. And so that lawyer came with me into the federal building. And I uh, turned myself in. I was just in the jail, federal jail, for a half hour, uh, released on my own recognizance. And then I ended up with a court trial. Uh, the court trial, I went about three different times, uh, different proceedings. But the lawyer, because I was never, uh, they were so hungry for young men at that time that they didn't follow proper procedures. I had appealed uh, m m that I was being drafted as a student. You, you could apply for a deferment. I did that, but they had closed the case before the 10 days that they were supposed to. So on technical grounds, my case was dismissed. They did draft me again, and at that time, uh, Swami made me a minister, and I decided I would cooperate to a certain extent. I went down to the uh, draft board, and they asked questions about past affiliations. And I had been, I had been to a Communist Party meeting, so <laughs> and they, that, that got me off. <laughs> it was when Ben I came down to San Jose to actually do some of that stuff, that work that I, I already knew Ben I from a, a few years before, and Tom. And so when I saw, I, I saw him, and we ran into each other once again, and that's how I learned about it, not doing that, so maybe I decided to come. Joe Tish, why don't you talk, tell about in, uh, your your uh, incense business because that was a significant oh, yeah. thing. That was a funny story. Yeah, yeah that was good. good. And then the next round, incense. We we realized by the fall, as we have been saying, that we needed to find a way to have some income. The only business that we had, if you could call it that, was the uh, retreat, meditation retreat. And it produced some income, but really all it could do was pay the expenses and the food of the staff and uh, take care of itself. It didn't produce any extra income. And we knew that we needed not only to have extra income, uh, but, but Swami had told us that he would carry the mortgage for the first year, but then that would be the end of it, that we had to find a way to pay the mortgage after that. 
So as we were saying this morning, several of us uh, went down to the Bay Area in order to figure out a way to do businesses that could could uh, provide income and uh, wages for people to be able to stay here. And at that time, the Hare Krishnas were selling a lot of incense. And someone suggested, well, why don't you try uh, an incense business? And so I thought, well, that was a fine idea. Now, I didn't know until years later, but they basically bought their incense, or they bought, uh, they're called punk sticks, and they're used for firecrackers and so on. But they bought sticks that were made in India or China, and then they sent it them and packaged them. They didn't make them themselves, but not knowing that, um, I decided, well, you have to make incense. So I went, <laughs> read a book, and uh, uh, Davy says, I've got to tell the whole story. <laughs> All right, this is not for the squeak. <laughs> but it said that uh, in India they made incense out of cow gum. And so I figured, well, we get cows here. <laughs> cows make cow dung. I'll go get some. So I went out into the fields and I got some cow patties. And I put it in a blender. And, oh. <laughs> and it didn't, didn't exactly make incense. <laughs> You've got to have a binder for so the next round I put flour and water in the cow patties. And that actually made something that stuck together. But it was not going to be a really popular product. I mean, I, I was not much of a businessman, but I did have to understand that this was not going to go big at Macy's. <laughs> And so then I read further and found out that incense was also made from charcoal. And so there we had a starter uh, that seemed better based than the <laughs> And so I experimented much of the time in San Francisco. I was experimenting. And so uh, I would take charcoal and then I was reading up and finding different kinds of binders and finally there were certain kinds of tree gums and so on that you could buy commercially. And in fact, it produced a kind of a mix that held together. And then incense sticks need sticks. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, where can you get sticks? So I went and sometime I was in some sort of a used shop and I saw bamboo curtains hanging there and they, they were just old and kind of ratty, and, but they were made up of lots and lots of little sticks. And so I started going around San Francisco buying up all these old bamboo <laughs> curtains, and I would cut them down into 12-inch sticks. And if you dip that into this <coughs> mixture of uh, charcoal and gum resins and so on, and then let it dry, it coated it, and in fact produced uh, a much nicer incense stick than the um, Hare Krishnas were using. And then you had to, I had to find out how to scent that, so I got uh, certain kinds of essential oils. And so by the time we got to the full production, which came back up uh, in the spring from San Francisco back up to Ananda, I had devised a little kind of a, a board with little slots in it. And so you'd take, uh, we had uh, saws and we'd cut up all these incense sticks. Then you'd take and you'd drop 10 little sticks into these slots and put another board on top, sandwich them, and rubber band those two together. And then you had a board here that had 10 little sticks hanging down. And then you dip that into the mixture of charcoal and gum resins. And then you hung those up. So by the time we got into production, we had racks and racks and racks, you know, hundreds of these uh, racks, not racks, but hundreds of the little boards with drying incense. And then we would scent them with uh, different oils. But the 
charcoal and gum resin had the quality that bacteria like to feed on it. So we had five gallon plastic barrels with this mixture in. I had to come down every morning early with a kind of paint mixer and mix it up because like bread overnight, the, the bacteria or the yeast would be eating it and would come up and bubble over. And, uh, after it was dry, we didn't have that problem, but while it was wet, we could do that. So I had to come down before the, the great mass of workers came down in the morning to be working in, on the production lines and get it all going. But that, along with Benai's little jewelry business, and later we added, you saw the picture of those little bottles of oil. Since we were buying the scented oils, we figured out a way to bottle those and sell them. At the height of it, that business was selling about $10,000 a month. And in those days, that was, a, that was <coughs> probably five times as much as the sum total of all the rest of the operation, uh, the economic flow. So for the first three or four years, it provided the major uh, employment at Ananda. And there were probably 25 or 30 people who earned their living because they could work part-time. Later on, we added uh, macrame plant hangers, and that was especially nice because mothers could do it in their homes doing piecework and uh, while their kids were at home. And so we had a whole little economy going, but uh, Benai and Hari Das and I, we depended on this distributor because uh, he could get it out much more widely. And we went down one time, this was several years later, probably 74, 75, something like that. And by then, the major uh, seller were these macrame plant hangers, and he just announced that um, he had found a way to produce our designs cheaper in the Philippines, and he was done with us. Why import the jute and have us tie it into knots when he could have them tie it into knots much cheaper? And so we were just like that. It was the business went from very very strong down to down to minimal, but it had by that time served its purpose. I have a funny story about how that how the incense was actually made and the and the stuff which I always refer to as the black boo. And, and <laughs> there was one one of our one of our team that was designated as the guy who had to dip the sticks in the boo, and he also then dipped the oh he mixed the stuff as well. Well, his name was Bamal, and so he had this contraption that I think Joe Tish built. It looked to me like it was a, a drill with a, one of the things that a, 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 a milkshake mixer, uh, whatever that's called. So he he would sit over the vat and he would mix and mix and mix and mix and mix to get it all going again. And um, it had to be a certain height so that you could dip the sticks in the, and actually get the stuff on them the right way. So Bama would be in there every day or every other day with this thing, and it, the stuff splattered everywhere, <laughs> especially on Bama. And he was always covered with little things of black goo all over. You know? <laughs> then on top of that, he was also the one designated to dip in the scent. So he did that, and then he put them all away. Well, you always knew when Bama was in your neighborhood because you could smell him. <laughs> He smelled good, fortunately. <laughs> and he was always covered with this black. So I've always thought that there's a special place in heaven for Bamal, and it's really, really clean. <laughs> that, uh, we started, we, Jyoti started the incense uh, business in uh, behind Master's Market now, there's a, uh, where the, uh, I guess it's the pizza shop is now. That building from the pizza shop used to go much further back all the way back to uh, the house where McKean is living now, and it was called Yanni's. Went further back there, so he started way in the back right there, but it was very soon after uh, starting, it be, we began to realize, and Joe began to realize it was going to need much more space than that. So we ended up building 
a, uh, constructing a building, which actually turned out to be quite successful. Uh, I don't know whose design that was. Do you, I don't know. No, but I'll, it, I'll tell you a okay, little back story okay, but after then, you're done. Yeah, okay. The, we made this building, but uh, we laminated one by fours together into making, uh, so we could make an arch. And it made a nice uh, cathedral arch. And, uh, and we made that building, and then we covered it all with polyethylene. So it was more, uh, plastic. more plastic, and we thought <laughs> plastic was big, you know, cheap. And, uh, and so we covered that thing with uh, with polyethylene, and actually, it actually made a pretty good building. And so that one was successful, and we ended up then there was that using that same design. We built uh, a barn, and the Kula built uh, the, the, that's gone now. Isn't it? Yeah. Yes, yeah. the guy that was the, we built the a, 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 the first dairy barn uh, with. Uh, with our Ananda Dairy, he built it, used that same shape, although he covered it with wood. He covered it with planks and yeah. made it into a real barn. And then we built another one, if you remember, up at uh, the <coughs> retreat. Oh, for the candy shop? Yeah. Yeah. For the candy yeah. shop. Yeah. And this, which is another business that got going that we didn't mention, that they're at, at, uh, at the candy shop. And uh, uh, I don't know, you could probably tell some candy shop stories. But anyway, that, <laughs> but it was okay. very nice. Tell you a little, the background story of the cathedral uh, building. So my my father and mother were both architects. My older brother's an architect, my best friend. And I come from a nest of architects. <laughs> <laughs> and so I wrote my father saying that we needed to build a building for this little business that I was starting and could he lend me $500? And I got back a letter with a check for $500 saying, the only, here's $500, I'm happy to just give it to you, but the only building you can do for $500 is dig a hole in the ground and cover it with a blanket. <laughs> <laughs> so that produced the challenge. <laughs> so I'm not sure how it evolved to with the idea of laminating our own beams. We knew it was too expensive. Again, because we had the rounded and kind of shaped uh, idea of, of high ceiling buildings. Um, we knew that it was too expensive to buy the proper wood, but we could buy little one by one, one by four struts very inexpensively. We actually put, measured it out and put pegs on the ground in the shape that we wanted. And then we would lay out these and we would put glue and then the next uh, line of boards on and we'd drill that in and put glue until we had built up uh, at least a four by four, maybe a four by six uh, inch strut in the shape of a half of an arch. And then we combined those with a ridge pole and then uh, covered it with this plastic. And we did have out of $500 enough to pour a concrete floor. And so uh, it, we did the whole building for under $500 and I'm very proud of it. <laughs> Proudly took a picture of it and sent it to my dad and said, "Here," and I made sure that it was a nice picture, nicely lit, uh, with a person standing there so he could see the scale. And I said, "Here's your $500 building." He always he always enjoyed that. <laughs> well, the last one of those buildings that uh, they talked about was for the candy shop. So this this was another biz, business that we that we got going, and uh, even though we didn't have much to eat, we always had sweet tooth, and we discovered that uh, milk powder was quite sweet, and we would make sweets out of it and just enjoy them. But then we got the idea that maybe we could make this and sell them in health food stores. So uh, who was it? It was me and Nandi. Was it you? You? Was it Sarti? Huh? Mukti. 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 Anyway, the, uh, this, this is the women's business. So we made up uh, different batches. Now, now let's see what we can remember. There was the Bhakti bar. We started Bhakti off with David Delight. So now the David Delight. Of the own bar. The old bar. So it was like raisins and, and dates. Yeah. Some bar seeds, I think. 
sunflower seeds. Now, now the bhakti bar was white. Yeah, was that was just honey and milk powder and nuts and raisins. Oh, okay. what was the peppermint one? That was uh, moksha mint. That was moksha mint. <laughs> 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 okay, so, so there it was in this new building and with all of you working there. And of course, there was no heat in the building. I mean, this was just like all of them. Anyway, uh, maybe we had a little something. But we made them and we packaged them and we hand wrote the little labels and we sold them. Well, just about that time, uh, there were these Renaissance fairs down in Marin County. And thousands of people would go and it was, you could you know, pay, pay a certain amount of money and go and be a vendor. So we thought, this is great, we'll get everything ready. So for, we bought these like trunks. There were, there were military arm, Ammunition trunks. <laughs> <laughs> Just to set it up, I had gone the year before with the incense and oils and made quite a large profit. And so we knew that the Renaissance Fair was a very good venue and quite viable and for our business. It was businesses. called the Renaissance Pleasure Fair. Right. Just to put it in. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so we had we had the ammunition things. And we said we're gonna we're gonna sell a lot. So we spent about two or three months. Well, we borrowed a whole bunch of money. <laughs> yeah, this is gonna. It's gonna get worse. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's gonna progress into a full confession. <laughs> well, I just remembered. I think the good parts, and I'll. <laughs> fill in the rest. So we made all of the bhakti bars and the David lights and the motion mints and everything. We put them in plastic and we put them in there. So we're going to a Renaissance pleasure fair. What are we going to dress up as? And I don't know why, I don't know what it was, but we dressed up as Franciscan monks. We called it St. Francis Fudge. So there it was, and we were, we were at St. Francis Fudge. We dressed up in these Brown no. brown yeah, because brown. it was cheap. That's why. <laughs> so brown, so brown so shoulder <laughs> things cut off. <laughs> so there, there we were, and we transported, you know, these things down, and we set up our stand, and then some of us have baskets, and we fill it up, and we go to sell them, and all of a sudden people start opening it up to eat them, and they're green. <laughs> No way. And they were green. They had most of them had turned green. At least the at least the, the white ones, the bucky ones. And it was the water. It was there there had been we had been using the water from, from the well and there had been bacteria in it and it just and it was a disaster. Sadna just Sadna just said we're the only ones that thinks it's fun. <laughs> There was another variety that didn't turn green, but that solidified to the point that you could not cut it with anything less than an industrial saw. And so by this time, because half of the batch had turned green, we were becoming more and more desperate. So we got either a chainsaw, <laughs> I think by the end it was a chainsaw, and we cut it into chunks. Well, not only was it hard to cut, but it was even harder to eat. <laughs> and so by the end of the fair, we had all of our little guys dressed up in these bizarre outfits, chasing after people because they were working on commission by this point. And anything they could sell, they could keep half of the profits. So they were trying to chase down any likely customer. But anyone who had ever by that time, the rumors were going around, <laughs> and everybody at the fair who had any savvy had been warned not to buy anything from any of these Franciscans. <laughs> one of them, those kinds, they were so hard that it, finally one lady came back. It busted out her tooth, oh, no. and I think we I think we paid her dentist bill. <laughs> We just thought this, is, this was a learning experience. Let's just keep going. 
so there we were in our this building that had been built. But well, wait, we're still at the Renaissance oh, Fair. Okay. Just one more story. <laughs> so I was feeling quite shirty because I had my own booth. <laughs> and I was dressed far differently from these days. So I was selling incense and oils and doing, doing quite well, except that God punished me for my pride because the Renaissance Fair is over a number of weekends. It, I think it lasted a month. And so it was every weekend for a month. And I was making a profit indeed, but the booth across the road, and it was just a little road 20 feet wide, the booth across from me was someone with bagpipes. <laughs> so I, have, I have bagpipe music for 10 hours a day. <laughs> for, for Friday, Saturday, Sunday, for four weeks. <laughs> and, uh, that was our last Renaissance fair. <laughs> Why we didn't return the next year. <laughs> so we had this lovely design, and we were building this craft shop where we could have a nice place to make these wonderful health food candy bars. But the building inspector came up at a certain point, and he kind of looked at the property line, and um, he said to us, you know, You've built this half on off your property. This is on government land, and so we said, "Oh, okay. Well, we'll just stop building. We'll just use it as it is." So it was just it was for plastic struts. We threw some. I mean, the wooden struts. We threw some plastic over it, but you couldn't heat it because it was very tall. It had no running water, so we would run a hose. This was in the meadow at the meditation. We run a hose up from the top. That was our water that we used. And of course, when it snowed, we would, the lines would freeze, and we would just melt snow to wash the dishes. And, um, but we would be making and these bars. Sometimes we'd still be getting water somehow. <laughs> and it was so cold that we had to wear our down jackets. And so, you know, we've got honey and milk powder and nuts and raisins. So we'd come up for lunch, and we'd just say, oh, you're making the moksha mint bars today. <laughs> Sometimes we'd have big orders, we'd have to stay up late at night and have little candles all around so we could make the little bars. And, you know, we were all college graduates. I mean, it wasn't like this was so, <laughs> so... Probably not right to brag about that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 we made, but we're still making these little, I don't know, they were like three inches by, or two inches by two inch squares, and we put the label that said Moksha Mint or Dave Delight or Bakhti Bar, whatever it is. We put the ingredients. And so then we got word that the health inspector was coming to check out the facilities. Well, we had no running water, we had no heat. We didn't have walls, you know, no electricity. And, um, and the night before he was going to be come, coming, the omnipresent raccoons broke into the storeroom and they tore everything open, the bags of coconut and bags of milk. Water. And one of the little raccoon, one of them had gotten his little paw stuck between two boards and he trying to pull it out, he kind of cut his little hand, these little bloody raccoons. <laughs> on the verge of a nervous problem. I said, what in the world do you do here? And we very proudly held it. We make these little candy bars. Right? And gave it a lie. And he took one and he looked at it. And he said, you have to put the weight on the label. <laughs> Your story about taking the ohm bars on your hike, your trip. Uh, I, this was in the early days of the ohm bars, uh, because they, when you first when you first ate them, they were They're actually good. quite good. They were actually, the ohm bar was, I think, the, the best one. It was correct. We would put yeah, dates but, and zigs and raisins and coconut in a meat grinder. So we and so. 
they were making those and they would sell them. They would sell them in the little, but you could also get a bar, a big bar of it, like a, about a pound of it. So my, my friend and I were going on a, on a two-week hike in the uh, high Sierra, in the Sierra. So I thought, well, gee, you know, I need something to eat, you know, and I'll just take this along with me. And so anyway, instead of taking all sorts of other things, I basically took that <laughs> for two weeks. And uh, I got up there, I got up there, and we, you know, and pretty soon first I was eating it, and then I was trading my friend. You know, I says, well, here, you eat some, and I'll eat some of yours. And then, but by the end of the first week, I was trading it off on the trail. And when we pass, and I, I would give them, I would give them a, a big bar, a wolf bar, a wolf bar, and then they would give me something back. But uh, after that trip, I never I, I lost a total taste for wolf bars. So you can see that there was the grace of God uh, on this community just allow it to survive and to allow us to stay alive because it's not by our own cognition. <laughs> I remember that we were under the health department's uh, rule and that really helped us in the early right. days. Yeah. Rather than building inspectors, it was the health department. That yeah, there was a very nice man who had been all around the world to primitive societies. <laughs> working with us and they had designated Ananda as a church camp and church camps weren't regulated by the building or planning department but by the health department and this man was very nice and worked with us and in fact later on kind of fought the battle with the uh, with his own county supervisors to keep them from redesignating us so that they could squash us. But it was a, a very, very helpful thing. Hal Cox. He's Hal probably Cox. Number one of our patrons. Yeah, he was yeah. one of our patrons. But, but now I, I think Jones just told me that once he visited you in your teepee and you had a tarantula, Oh, oh, did I have it in a jar then? No, or no, there was. <laughs> I visited Benai in his teepee and he said, you want to see something neat? <laughs> I said, sure, sure. I mean, everybody knew that Benai had a variety of animals that visited him. So. But I was not prepared for this. But out of the corner, and he had created a little space that he didn't disturb. There was a little tarantula. Now, I'd never seen a tarantula here and have never since. I think it came from Probably bananas. came on, on some bananas, but at any rate, there was a tarantula there and he took a little uh, stick. He said, now he's pretty aggressive. <laughs> kind of it up like that. And then he didn't tease him anymore because he was kind of a semi-pet. Uh, probably didn't last there very long. <laughs> Can you tell the story about, if you remember, you were, it was snowing you were up to treat and you were walking home and you stopped in front of a little kitty and you got totally disoriented. Oh. At the meditation retreat, yeah, it was the fog would would often often come comes up there, and I it's possible that it was the winter when it was just uh, Jai and Satya and me and somebody else. But anyway, the, the temple was the only warm place; and it, it had a heater, and so we would be there as much as possible. And so one night I was up there meditating. It was late; the sun was down, and the fog was up. And I just wasn't prepared. I didn't have a flashlight, so uh, I came out of the temple. It was out. It was after midnight. Nobody was around, and I just I couldn't think where to go. And I started down the path, and then there was a kitten, and I bent down, and I lost my orientation, and I couldn't find my way back to to the trailer. My trailer was out on Sunset Boulevard, quite far away, and I just walked around and around and got more and more lost and. Uh, I had a meditation leg, but I wouldn't sleep in the temple because, you know, you shouldn't sleep in the temple. It's not good. So uh, I just, I took my blanket and I rolled myself up under a bush and went to sleep and waited for the sun to come up. And it did, and I found my way home. <laughs> 
I have a great raccoon story. I have to. We all we all have our animal stories, and uh, this, this one's become famous. When when we moved to Ayodhya uh, in in the monastery in the convent, there were uh, the women were living together, and it was uh, Ayodhya is the property right up here, uh, about yeah, the, 200, 300 yards away. Where, up where, the, the hill. where the housing cluster is right now, and uh, I was there in Seva, and. Uh, we were there. Anyway, and, and the monks weren't too far away, but we were still being plagued by the raccoons. By that time, I had graduated from a teepee to a small trailer. And the trailer uh, was so small that I could touch both walls. <laughs> and it was long enough uh, you know, to have a bed and a table. And in, in those days, the, the signs of, of prosperity were if you had graduated from reading by candlelight to kerosene, from kerosene to an Aladdin lamp. That was, you know, you saved your, your, your $25 a month to get your Aladdin lamp. The other thing was L.L. Bean boots that had the felt lining in it. So if you had your boots, and your Latin lamp, you were. <laughs> that was a big status symbol. <laughs> so there was, there, there was my trailer, and there was enough room for my, for my kerosene lamp at that time and my L.O. Bean boots. But the door on my trailer wasn't, didn't belong to it. It was another door, and it didn't close by about that much. And there was a latch, but there was like about two inches where it didn't close. So every day I'd go to the garden and work, and I'd come home at night, and the raccoon, especially one, would have slid his hand up, and I'd latched it, and have uh, created a mess. Well, one, <coughs> one evening I come in, it's already dusk or dark, and I'm there with my flashlight, and sure enough, there's the raccoon. But he's right in this tiny place, and he's sitting in the middle of the floor, now raccoons are prehensile, so they have a thumb that works. He had opened up my tiny little refrigerator, taken out a, a jar, which had my dinner in it, and opened it. And he was sitting on the floor eating my dinner. And I walked in and I shined my flashlight and I said, out. And he just, no way. <laughs> he, was, he was not moving. And I yelled and I jumped up and down. And so finally, I slid past him, got a broom, and got him out of there. So at that point, we said, we're finished with the raccoons. So we had the guys make this trap, uh, nonviolent trap, that had a spring, it was big, it had a spring, and we knew his favorite foods, which were cheese and chocolates, <laughs> which tells you what our diet was. <laughs> so, we put the trap in, in the middle of, of an opening, and we lined every, the path from everybody's house with chocolates. And inside, we put the big piece of cheese. And we all went to sleep and said, okay, you know, we're gonna get him, we're gonna get him. So the next day we get up, the chocolates are all gone. And, but there's no raccoon inside the trap. But by gosh, the raccoon was outside of the trap, he had been too clever to go in. He put his paw through the bars, and he took hold of the cheese, but he couldn't get it out. And he just spent all night holding that cheese, and he wouldn't let it go. And so we thought, okay, we're gonna get him out of here. So we got a big board, we slid it under the, the trap, and we literally picked up the trap with a raccoon outside of the trap, loaded it onto a truck, and drove it, you know, like five miles down the road. Left it and came back, you know, a few days later, and he was gone. Now, I don't know if that's all our raccoon, but it was such an incredible yeah, lesson, at least for me, in attachment. <laughs> that guy, I mean, he was willing to risk his life 
just to hold on to that piece of cheese. <laughs> now, 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 lest you think that our diet was composed solely of chocolate and cheese, it wasn't. In fact, our diet was so magnificent that the monks produced what has long been known as the monks' cookbook. So the monks' cookbook had a variety of recipes that all had common ingredients. And the common ingredients was tortilla chips and cheese. <laughs> so there were such things as the basic monk's cookbook, monk's recipe, which was you take a handful of chips in your left hand, a chunk of cheese in your right hand, and you alternate. <laughs> Then there was chips a la, which was a really fancy recipe because you actually cut the cheese. So there were about 20 or 25 recipes, all with chips and cheese, and I was in the most I, I hope somebody has one of those. I mean, yeah. If we have a strut from the first dome, there must be one. There must be that. In, in the winter, we ate just what we grew in the garden. So Hanel, being uh, the brilliant gardener that he was, uh, had us plant things that would last through the winter. And the two basic things were potatoes and squash. And uh, we lived for several years on potatoes and squash. And we did it, you know, every possible way. You know, mashed potatoes and baked potatoes and this and this. And, uh, I don't know why, but I still love potatoes and squash. <laughs> they were really good, and especially if you had just a little bit of money to buy some butter <laughs> and some salt, and it was great. And even today, the last one of the last letters I've written to our community in uh, Italy is to make sure that this year we're putting away potatoes and squash. <laughs> and not to always grow squash in Monte Maria. So we, Davy and I, get a big box of winter squash to get us through the winter. Let's just tell uh, a real quick story, Shabbat, that Shabbati story about the raccoon uh, and the lessons you learn from animals. Once I was, you know, lest you think all we did was develop Totally inane, impractical businesses. <laughs> we also meditated a whole lot. I mean, it, that was really our life. We would get up, we had no money, we had minimal housing, you know, bean boots were a real luxury that you saved up for all summer to get. And, but we would meditate. And we would get up in the morning and we would meditate. We'd go serve all day long, we'd stop at noon, meditate come home, clean up, meditate, have a little dinner or whatever you can throw together, maybe read a little bit, meditate, go to bed. That was all of our lives. I mean, we really didn't do, and it was fantastic. And maybe, anyway, and then in our spare time, we would develop these candy businesses and insurance businesses and all that. But, and nature was, now it's still prevalent, but then it was there realm still. We were the visitors. Now they're the visitors and it's our realm. But there's a certain kind of a lizard that lives in this area. I think it's called a blue-bellied skink. Is that what it is? Blue-tailed skink. Blue -tailed skink, thank you. And they have this beautiful iridescent peacock blue belly, but they also have an ability when they're attacked by prey, they can detach their tail and just shoot it off like 20 feet down the road. So I had just finished meditating and I was walking up to the um, dining room at the meditation retreat. And we had a, a little kind of a kitty that belonged to everybody. Her name was Lottie. She was this little gray kitty and she'd had a hard life, but there she was. She was she'd been adopted by Anana. So I was crossing the road and all of a sudden before me, the first thing I saw was this drama going on there was Lottie stalking this blue-bellied skink. And I was I just became totally engrossed. Then Lottie caught the lizard in its mouth in her mouth, but he ejected his tail and it just shot off way down the road. And there's nerve endings in the tail, so it thrashes around. So and what the lizard does is the lizard goes limp and the tail is thrashing around. But, and so Lottie thinks, well, I've got this nothing in my mouth, but there's something really going on now. <laughs> and she drops the lizard and starts going after the tail. And the lizard, meanwhile, is crawling away. And, just, and I sh you know, it's sort of like, 
Star Trek thing's the first initiative. You're not supposed to get involved and change the person. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't help it. I said, Lottie, Lottie, no, no, forget the joke. Go ahead. <laughs> She could still catch the, the lizard, so she got the lizard, and the same, the same thing happened. And the lizard goes limp, and the tail is thrashing. And so by this time, I thought, no, I've got to let the karma play itself out. So Lottie dropped the lizard, ran after the tail, and the lizard got away into the bushes. And then Lottie came back, and she had this tail, you know, just nothing, bones in her mouth. And she looked up at me, and I said, I tried to get it. I knew there was some muscle in there, and I got into it. I was thinking about it. I got up to the dining room and I saw Sava and I told her what happened. And I said, there's some lesson there. And she just looked at me and she said, not attachment. <laughs> okay, any more questions? They're afraid to ask. <laughs> Mr. Sears. So, at what point did you get electricity? Because you said you had a sewing machine. What'd you say? When did you get electricity? Oh, we, we had always had electricity in front of the market, uh, or in the market building. That that was a house, and um, so I sewed it out on the front, <coughs> what we call the lawn, which is kind That's, of a stretch. It's <laughs> <laughs> actually the dirt out there in the front. And so anyway, so I sewed it out there. This is not the street. This is down the village. Yeah, yeah. in front of the master's market. That market, actually, that building is uh, quite a historic, is actually a historical building in the area here. It, uh, 1864, one, I think. Pardon? 1864. 1864. Yes, in the 18, right in the early 18, 1860, 64, uh, it went, uh, the area was a, was a very prosperous gold mining area with the, uh, with the hydraulic <coughs> mines that were going on. And uh, that farm, at that time started up along with the Myers Ranch next door and they the main highway used to come right there by uh, where the Rick has his office there with the, with the Ananda Bell where Benai has his shop there that that was the main highway that came and it went up through you know through the expanding light area there and then follows the road up which is now Brotherhood Way and where the goats are living right now up, if you see them up there, that's over the hill. It went right over the hill, then and down the other side, off to North San Juan. Mm -hmm. And so that, uh, uh, but it was, it was the Wells Fargo stayed and come used to come all, all the time. And uh, there's so there's probably still floating around the old picture of the of the ranch from uh, actually the market has it. Back, yeah, it's that. back in the late late uh, 18th, 18th century at the 19th. Century. 19th century. 19th. 19th century. And uh, so they were, uh, uh, it, the, the, the ranch uh, went through a number of different uh, hands, but it, that ranch and a few others used to supply the food source of many of the miners that used to live in the, in the area here. It was, uh, in those days, that part, just right up the road toward where the clinic is now, was the town of Cherokee. And uh, it was a, quite a, uh, a going concern in the, in the old days. And there was a lot of people that used to live in this area. The population, now here we brought it back up. But before we came, the population went way down. But it actually was quite a populated area at one time. Our ranch then became known, before it was, it was the Sylvester Ranch before we bought it. And then before the Sylvesters, who had owned it, I think they'd owned it about 10, 15 years, somewhere in there. Maybe not, maybe a little longer, but in the, it was known as the 4T Ranch, and it was a very prominent ranch in the area here. And then predating all that, this area was inhabited by American Indians, yes. the Maidu tribe, for thousands of years. And when we first came here, we would often find Indian artifacts, arrowheads and carved little bone uh, alligators and lizards and things like that. And they said the area up by um, around where the Living Wisdom Center is, that was probably we, we had an archaeologist come and tour around. They said that was probably a sacred burial site, and uh, that they would move different according to the season. But they one of the main sources of food for them was um, acorn 
grind, you know, you take acorns, which are quite bitter, you leach them in like the Yuba River, draw out all the acid, then you grind them into a paste and, and, and make it into food. And about four years ago, Swamiji said, you know, the American Indians used to live on acorns. We should see, you know, explore that a little bit. <laughs> because in case of hard times, we had plenty of acorns with all the oak trees. So people really did. They, we, you know, people tried different things and they made different things out of them. But that some of our younger people kind of didn't quite, I don't know, they, they did a little spoof about it. And they did this play called the Revenge of the Squirrel. <laughs> but, but it tastes pretty terrible, actually. Even, even when well leached, it's, it's at, at its very best, it is completely bland. And so, but it's very nutritious. So we found that if you take about a quarter of the ingredients, say, of a cookie, and make that acorn instead of flour, that uh, you add the nutrients without ruining the taste completely. <laughs> Were there any projects or ideas that never got off the ground that you could see starting up again in the future? You mean Probably. recycling the failures? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, there were plenty of things that didn't get off the ground, but I don't think we want to try and make <laughs> We had a toy factory here that worked for a little while, and, but it was dependent on one person. We had somebody who was a shoemaker and cobbler, and we... Uh, there was a bakery. There was a bakery. Uh, we had one success, actually one that uh, has kind of ended now, but I don't think we could make it viable. But we had uh, a dairy, and as part of the dairy, they made granola. And but because they had to buy large uh, sacks of feed for the for the cows, they also realized that they could buy oats and you know stone flattened oats and make granola. And we sold a lot of granola, but that was before the big companies that have taken it But over. one idea actually that never, well actually Vyasa I think tried to start it for a while, but Swami said if we go into hard times, people won't be able to buy new appliances, small home appliances, vacuum cleaners, you know, mixers, etc., etc., toasters, and he said we should have a fix-it shop. Helping where hands. We, helping, 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 helping hands. Helping hands. Helping hands. Mm -hmm. And that actually would be a very nice business for somebody to start up rather than just Tossing the stuff, you know, fixing your little toaster ovens, fixing your little. So that that would be a nice thing. And Biasa had the uh, he had the electrical generator, the bicycle, uh, the bicycle it. generator. Oh, so oh yeah. That, uh, put that up in the financial it, 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 it was Al Anderson's invention. Bico generator. Yeah, yeah bico generator yeah. with the flour mills. Yeah. That was his product. Yeah. But. Um, it takes a lot of human power to be. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are a lot of ideas that could be had and revived if we were in extreme times. But like a bicycle generator or a bicycle flour mill, you know, it sounds romantic, but about the 15th day <laughs> that you realize that you have to ride that stupid bike and <laughs> get a pound of flour. It's less than greatly romantic when you can plug it into a socket. But if you didn't have electricity, it would be, be viable. But so many of these things are dependent upon the single person who either has the inspiration or the ability or the experience, the knowledge. So a fix-it shop would be great. Who among us knows how to fix anything? Yeah. Hey! There you are. Yeah. 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 And that was, it was a time when Swami Satchitananda, and pretty much at the same time Ananda came over, he was a disciple of Shivananda, and established his work in San Francisco, the Integral Yoga 
Society, and other saints would come over and visit, and they always stopped by Ananda. And there were a couple of things that stick out in my mind from those early years. One of them was Swami Chidananda. Chidananda was the successor of Swami Shivananda Saraswati from Rishikesh from the Divine Life Society. And he and Swami uh, were close. They had, they had a very good connection. And he was visiting the United States, some of their centers here, and he came to Ananda. And here are the things that, that I remember that were, uh, one of them was that uh, he wanted a tour of the garden. And the gardens were looking really nice. Uh, where the swimming pool is, uh, that was the tomato garden, and it was really beautiful with long rows of tomatoes and basil and parsley and okra, okra and uh, we were really proud of it. And, uh, so we took uh, Swami Chidananda, and he wanted to walk around the garden because it to perambulates. There's something holy about that. So we were following him around, and I was saying, oh, everything is really in order. And he stops by this big barrel, which uh, we were using for uh, <coughs> manure water. And it was covered, and it was all right, but there was a little can by it, you know, where it was a dipper, where we would dip it in. And it was a bit rusty. And he stopped and pointed down to that, and he said, you know, you should paint that because it attracts lower astral entities. I thought that was very interesting. And he continued on his walk, and you bet we painted that can. <laughs> and then he, he was at the meditation retreat. Quite a number of saints were at the meditation retreat at that time, the Indian saints. And, and I'll always remember this. There were, uh, I don't know how it is now, but there were three steps on the outside up to up to the you know entryway of the temple, and and he prostrated, mm -hmm. and he touched every one of those steps, mm -hmm. and he said, he said there have saints have walked over these steps, and many saints in the future will walk here, and I honor them, mm -hmm. and so he he gave that lesson, mm -hmm. and uh, he went on. Uh, I don't know that. I don't know if he was at that time the head of the Divine Life Society. I think he became, later became. And uh, it was just really very touching. And um, another one of Shivananda's disciples whom Shivananda had said was the crown jewel of his work. His name was Swami Venkateshananda. He had been with Shivananda for 17 and a half years and had been his personal secretary. And he lived on the island of Mauritius and had his ashram there. But he, uh, he visited and came, would come, and we would go and meditate with him and so forth. And uh, he wrote a, a beautiful article in their magazine about Ananda, saying what a wonderful place it was and what a wonderful spiritual guide Swami was. Well, he told a story. I've always remembered it, and I'd like to pass it on to you because perhaps it, would, it will inspire you. He told us a story. He said, I remember the first day I saw my guru. It was in Rishikesh, and I had walked many, many, many miles, hundreds of miles, uh, to see him. And I came up on the river, and I was on the other side of the river, and I looked over at the ashram, and I was just filled with joy. And I thought, oh, I wonder, is he going to be there? Does he know that, that I'm here? And so I took a boat across the river, and there he was. It was his bathing got, and he was in the river. And he was getting out, and he looked at me, and he smiled, and he held his hand out, and he welcomed me. And he said, I was just overwhelmed, just overwhelmed with, with gratitude and joy. And then he said, every day for the last, for all of these years has been the same for me has been the same. I've just kept that same joy of that moment of first seeing my guru, first seeing uh, the ashram. And every day is that day. And then he looked at us and he said, remember this and make sure that the joy you are feeling now in being in this ashram with your guru, you keep with you always. Mm -hmm. And then you'll always be happy.